Hi, this is Keith Bradbury of Mojo Mouthpiece Work. Over the years, you've seen a number of my videos, and uh, most of them show me using a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, to help me with refacing. This is kind of a fairly new school way of do it, doing it. Um, probably popular the last 15 years or so. Um, before that, guys, and I started out this way too, using uh, note paper or, uh, or cards, file cards to record your measurements on. Uh, you get a good one and that becomes your master and you try to copy that facing onto other mouthpieces. Uh, but there's a lot of advantages to using a spreadsheet. And there's some simple spreadsheets that have been available through the mouthpiece work uh, Yahoo group, which uh, is now dead. Uh, but I've saved the files from that group as a resource that you can get on the Google Drive. There'll be a link to that uh, in the comment section of the video. There'll also be a link to my personal spreadsheet, which up until now I've been reluctant to share, mostly because I didn't want to support it. It takes uh, a fair amount of Excel skills, and I didn't want to be teaching basic Excel or advanced Excel skills to people to use my spreadsheet. Um, and if I sold it, I'd feel obligated I'd have to do that. Um, I don't really need the money, uh, so I'm going to give it away um, and make a few videos to show how I use it, and hopefully that'll take care of most of the support issues. So, what you what you need is a copy of Microsoft Excel. I've tried some other spreadsheets that look like Excel, uh, but there's one key feature in Excel called the solver routine, which um, is not implemented well in, in the clone spreadsheets. There's a few that don't have it, and a few that do have it, but when you actually try to run the calculation, it just doesn't converge right. So I have a copy of Microsoft Excel 365. If you open that up, and you get to my spreadsheet, which I've named Mojo Mouthpiece Elliptical Facing Spreadsheet. This is what will come up. Now, the solver that I mentioned needs to be added into your copy of Excel. Uh, you might have to Google how to do that, but basically I'll show you. You go under Options, Add-ins, And you see I have the solver add-in already in mine. Uh, you might have to go to Manage Add-ins and see that it's checked. If you'll, you, you, you may need to load some software if this is not already loaded. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that other than you need it. And when it's added in, in my copy, it's under the data menu item, all the way to the right is something called Solver. And when you click on it, this spreadsheet, I mean, this uh, window should come up. And we'll be using that later. I'll show you to curve fit the data. So, when this spreadsheet first comes up, there's, I'll show you the amount of real estate that's used. This is everything in the spreadsheet. So I have, and I'll go over all these areas. Off to the right is just a copy of a report that I fill out and I print when I'm done. Okay, the top is going to be a data entry area. Then the middle is an area where um, I work and uh, view the facing curve. And then at the bottom is a scratch area that has data used in the plot to get it to look how I want. Take this back up to 100%. So, I'm gonna skip through some of these. Um, 
Uh, let me uh, go over what an elliptical curve looks like. So when you have a mouthpiece, there's a facing curve on it from here on out. You have a flat table, and then you'll have a curve. Now, for a radial curve, this is a circle with a radius that's tangent here all the way up to the tip opening. This is where your reed would be. So here's your tip opening. And this circle, it's just a little segment of a circle. You know, if you have a whole picture of the circle, we'll be looking at this much of it would be like the facing curve. So um, now for an elliptical, so this is B and this is A. When they're equal, you get a radius. And, you know, the, 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 the same spreadsheet can be used for a radial curve. When they're not equal, um, you know, we have A, you know, A over B. Okay, that equals the aspect ratio. Or in my system, I use a plus and a number. So when it's a four, your A distance is four times larger than the B distance. And that's a, you know, when it's a one, it's a, it's a radius. So that's my convention for the formulation. There's other curves we could use, and some of my other um, videos as a follow-up, we'll go over some of the other curves I occasionally use. Or you can use no curve at all, but then you really wouldn't need a spreadsheet if you're running off curve. So all that's programmed into this spreadsheet already. Now, when I bring up a new spreadsheet like this, this one has a tab that's called blank. I don't use this spreadsheet. I make a copy of it. So you right-click on blank, blank, then you go to Insert, and it'll say worksheet and you say okay and you get sheet one here and you go to blank again you click on it and you click on this upper left hand corner square because that'll select the entire spreadsheet so you can copy it then you right click with your mouse and you go to copy you go to sheet one if you have to click in the upper left hand corner right click paste Okay, and it, it looks like it all comes over. The thing is, it all comes over except for the graph. The graph comes over, but it's still pointing to the data in the other spreadsheet. So to fix that, you click on the graph, you have to go up to Chart Design, Select Data, and when this comes up, you know, it, 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 it jumps over to the blank tab and highlights the area in the scratch area that is being plotted. I don't want that. I want the same area on my new sheet one. There's all I have to do is click on sheet one, then hit OK, and it will jump so that now when you click on this, it highlights all the range down at the bottom here that is correct for getting started. OK? So now you're ready to go. I have tenor here, you can change that to alto or whatever, but the amount of um, feelers that I have set up here is typical for tenor mouthpiece, um, but that's just a text field. You know, and I fill that, all, this whole area out for each new mouthpiece. None of this is used in a calculation. Most of it's not used in a calculation, you know. What I have today as a sample mouthpiece is a, um, a mach rough machine blank from Laurie Waldron in the UK, LAW mouthpieces that I've had laying around for a while um, that uh, I've been meaning to finish into something. So, and the owner can be you. In this case, I'm going to put Mojo. Make LAW model uh, MCB blank. Uh, size doesn't have a side. Material is brass. You can put, I put down. GP for gold plating, SP for silver plate, brass, stainless steel, date measure, uh, 10, 14. Okay, that's that part. Comments, you can, I usually write down if there's some kind of damage to it. Um, then over here, um, I'll do this later. I, I measure the baffle profile down the center line. Uh, I take some other 
body dimensions, and a few of these I don't use anymore. Um, this one's kind of uh, comes in handy. The tip thickness, you know, I get a pair of calipers, I come over here, because this can help you later, can you figure out how much material you have to work with there. So I type that in. Uh, the bore diameter, in case you want to know if it's tighter or, or looser than, than other mouthpieces you've measured. Okay, total length, you know, things of that sort. Um, the wall, uh, what that is, is uh, this area here, which I use in a uh, plunger to measure the thickness of the material below the table at the bottom of the window you, you. That's pretty blunt there. So it's 58.058. Uh, table, what I use for that, it's good to kind of get an idea. You hold a straight edge on the table, you look for light under it, and you make a comment. Most of them are concave this way. I don't bother going across this way, but you can. And this one's flat, and some of them are convex. Okay, get the idea on that. So going over to the left is my starting um, facing readings. I've got old readings in there or just sample readings plugged in there. And I have my set of feelers plugged in. What you'll want to do in this column is plug in your feeler set. My set is, is over here and I have an entire video on feeler gauges. Uh, if you're only using five or seven, you need to plug in the numbers that you're going to use. Then you have to go down here and delete the area that you're not going to use and leave the rest there. Just you know, ignore the other cells. This will automatically copy your feeler set down into the, air, the working area while preserving uh, some starting readings here. Okay, so and then what's programmed in here is some data down this column is where you're going to be putting some data and if you both sides are the same reading it'll automatically uh, copy uh, the same reading to the right um, if not you have to manually pull put them in so I'm going to take the starting um, reading here's a glass gauge and, you know, that this is the only piece of equipment that's unique to mouthpiece for facing is a glass gauge Put your glass gauge on here, uh, zero it up, take your smallest feeler, it's 015 is my smallest, and that's usually the facing length, and drop it down in here. This is a pretty good machined facing on here. Uh, a lot of times it's crooked. So you'll, I measure, you know, each, each line is two numbers, and I measure the nearest tenth, so I'm really subdividing these lines by a lot, by 20, 20, you know, subdivisions. Um, that's really not easy to do, and I have an entire video on how I do that, but you should be able to at least get down to a half or a quarter. So um, maybe I'll just do something simple, though. It's hard for me to undo the way I normally do things. So I get 45 and a, th and a third on that, so 45.3. And look, I, I this makes things a lot easier for me. These, uh, uh, this is a Logitech pad, which I don't know if they sell anymore. Uh, so you see I typed in uh, 45.3 and automatically did the same thing on the right, but my right is a little longer. It's 43.5. Okay, that's the first reading. My second, drop that in there. I get 41.5. Let's call it 41.7. 6 
Okay, after I get all the uh, feelers in that I can do, you see I have a couple left over that wouldn't fit in there, then I take a tip opening reading and I use a depth gauge for that. There's other gauges you can use. So I get 14 numbers over 75, so that's 89. Uh, this magnifying glass to measure I measure the uh, thickness the width or thickness of the tip rail that's pretty thick 0 0.108 okay so that's your, that's your data input like I said, that should all copy. Let's see if I got an error somewhere. I'm doing it here. That's one nice thing. You go down to your, your graph, and if any of the numbers kind of jump around too much or, or look irregular, you can double check them. Like, you're looking down here, I've got a little squiggle here. Um, so I'm going to double check my third reading because sometimes I'll be off by an entire, you know, two numbers. So that should be probably 36.7. I mean, you know, 36.7 and 36.6. there we go. Now, I have to blank out, left click, drag across, let go, and hit delete. And that gets rid of that. Now, because I have a scratch area down here, I need to go clean up that area since I'm not using like the 109 feeler. So I scroll down with my mouse, or you can use these slider bars over here, and there's an area here, this is my main plot data. You know, if I click on the graph, it highlights the areas that I'm using the plot, okay? But there's one here, 109, that's got zero, zeros across. So I just click on that entire row, and I right click, and I delete it. And that collapses the spreadsheet. And I do the same thing down here. This just stores my started, starting readings. Delete that entire row across because I don't need the 109. Then go back and look at the graph. See the graph looks a little more normal though it, it does kind of double back on itself because of the uh, the last reading is your tip opening and how far it is away from the tip is calculated based on the tip rail width. Okay so there this is a start. Now I don't think it was this crooked back there. I must have typed something in wrong. It was uh, not 43.5, it was 45.5. So let me go back. I've been a little sloppy. Okay. So there's the blue data is through the average of the left and right readings. So across the bottom is the feelers. Here, why this is in the way, I don't know. And the length from the tip is off the glass gauge. Now this is an exaggerated facing curve with the mouthpiece in this orientation, okay? What it would look like if it was more to scale would be something like this. It's still kind of blow, blown up this way, but that's that's the facing curve. But in order for me to, you know, I can't do much looking at it that way. You know, I exaggerate it, and then you can see that the irregularity is easier and, and can work on it. So that's the blue line. The dashed lines are an exaggeration of how crooked it is at that point. So in this feeler, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth one from the top. One, two, three, four, five. At the 26 feeler, I had it as a little crooked. I had 27.4 on the left and 
7.6 on the right. Okay, so that's this area here. Um, and you would normally not see that, except um, I went down here at the bottom of the spreadsheet and I created um, an exaggerated um, left rail error times 10 and right rail error times 10 number. So there's a calculation in here that exaggerates um, the crookedness so that I can plot it on top of the curve so I can see it and correct it. Okay, so there's two of those lines. Then there's this magenta line, which will be a target curve. What's in there now is what's left over from copying the spreadsheet, but we're going to calculate a new target curve now. Okay? Okay, to do that, we go and we click on the sum diff. Let me go over what the sum diff is. So you have here the left reading, the right reading, and your feelers. Then you have a calculation of an elliptical facing curve here. Okay? Then I subtract whatever number the fit says from the reading. So they come up with a difference. And the difference is like the distance between this magenta line and the blue line for each of these feelers. Okay? And that distance can that can be positive or negative. Right now they're all positive. Okay, in some cases that could be negative. For instance, if I go down here and change one of the parameters. Here the magenta line is now, you know, this is a positive difference, it's black, and then the, over here is a negative difference, it's red. So you get these numbers. And then we calculate a different square. That is how far the uh, curve is from the data squared. So that's a trick where in mathematics you square it to get rid of the negative numbers, but still come up with an error number that you want to uh, get smaller and you try to minimize all of these numbers and that would give you a curve of best fit and the way we do that is this sum here there's an equation up here that is the sum of this column so this is what we call your error function and you want to minimize that so you click on that you go up to your solver and you hit the solver and it brings up this window and because you've already highlighted the objective cell, it's already filled up here. Then you want to hit min for minimum. Then you want to pick how you're going to do that. Do that. Well, we're going to change these blue, three blue numbers here. So I click on the bottom one, drag up until all three of them are highlighted, and it fills in this air, this uh, cell range right here. Okay. So these are the parameters that will be found, will be uh, moved by the solver um, part of the spreadsheet automatically for me to minimize this error, and that will move the curve closer to the data. So hit solve, and it thinks, and then you hit OK, and it comes up with these numbers. It moved them. And you notice the magenta line now runs through the data, and there's some difference. It's not zero, but it's a lot closer to zero. And the reason it's not zero is because your facing curve doesn't lie exactly on um, the theoretical curve, the uh, best fit. Okay, and right here, this is that AB ratio, which I said is the elliptical um, uh, aspect ratio. So in this case, it came up with a number that is less than one. So what that would be for is actually an ellipse in this direction, slightly, you know, where this is A and this is B. And with A being smaller than B, it came up with, you know, 0.7. So this distance is, you know, 30% less than this distance. Um, I don't use these type of curves. You can experiment with them um, because they they're uh, they bend more near the heart of the reed and less near the tip 
when I want to use that kind of a curve, I use a different formulation, something called a power curve, and we'll go over that at a later date. But the other problem is Excel, the way this spreadsheet is laid out, it's not well behaved when you get below 1 uh, and 0.5. Um, I, I think I would actually have to like flip the X and Y axis or something like that. Anyhow, it's not that important to me. So I generally, I avoid using um, numbers below one. So what I do is, is I go back to the solver. I click on the AB ratio. Well, no, I don't. I leave it in the, in, in the, in the uh, aerosol. I go back and I'm gonna force that to a one by going back to the solver. I'm going to add a constraint. You hit add. The cell reference I want is this AB ratio. And I want it to be greater than or equal to 1. Then I run the solver. You see it fills up the constraint here. Then you run the solver again, and it will force that to a number that's 1 or higher. You notice it hardly changed the curve at all. But now um, I at least know that that's a radial curve. Okay, and you could force that to be a radial curve also by saying it has to stay equal to a curve. Or you can just plug in one there, go back up to the solver, and where it says, you know, cell range, instead of picking all three of these cells, just pick two of these cells. This is how I force, um, well, I'm going to show you how I force uh, elliptical target curves next. So let me close this. Let's, let's say, you know, you'd, you'd be doing a lot if you just fixed the bumps and the flat spots in here to get them closer to the target curve. But let's say if you want to calculate a target curve that's elliptical. What I do is I delete all the data, all the, all, all the uh, numbers in this difference two column until it only has the first one and the last one. Okay, now if I wanted, let's say, a more open radial curve, I would leave this at 1. Let's say you want a 105. Plug in point 105. I might plug in a point, um, let's say, 025 tip rail width. And let's say I want a longer facing. Let's say I want a 48. I go over here and I say equal to this cell to make that a 48. The rest of these numbers don't matter. We're only going to be looking at the tip opening, which is from these numbers, it comes up with this calculation and eventually this difference, and then the starting point here. Okay, and then I'm going to go to the solver, data solver. I'm only going to, let me uh, delete all these, con let's delete this constraint. I'm going to go over to pick just these two cells, the one labeled A and the one start. So there's only two cells in here, and I say solve. And then I say OK. Now, the new, now it moved my data, you know, we, we forced this to 48. But actually, if I go back and I copy my starting data by highlighting these and dragging this up, okay, the actual starting data up here is 45 and change. So here's 45, but we forced the calculation to be 48 at that point. So my elliptical fit right at that cell is now 48 because that's you know, what we did. And same thing here is these numbers were forced at 105 and 25. Or if you go back and make this equal to your starting data, so now we have the blue data is back to what our measurements currently are, but the target curve is now a radial curve, okay, and this would be your, your target that where you want things to change to. You want to make all these blue numbers, which are your, you know, readings into whatever this elliptical target is, okay? Uh, uh, not, you know, in this case, the ellipse is a circle. Now let's say we wanted an ellipse 
with a uh, what I would call a medium-ellipse ellipse with an aspect ratio of 4. You can plug in a 4. We have to go back here and plug 48 into both these cells. Again, let's say our target was the same, 0 0.105, 0 0.025, okay? And just because I, I typed in a 4, my target curve went nuts, okay? So, um, sometimes it won't converge if it's this far off, but we'll give it a shot and see what happens, because this, this might be illustrative. So, now I'm going to force it to an, an ellipse of 4 to go to Data, Solver, and again, you can just leave everything the way it is because it's on the correct target. It's only going to change these bottom two numbers, and you hit solve. And I hit OK. And there is an ellipse of degree four. Now let me go back and you know, straighten out this data again. You really can't tell that much difference from uh, the last curve. Let me go try a higher number. Eight. This would be more like a classical mouthpiece. Okay. Data. Solver. Go. Okay. That's more extreme. Usually you wouldn't have a classical quite this, this, um, at this tip opening. So maybe I'll just put in like a, a six here. Data. Solver. Solve. Okay. So let me go restore this. Oops, made a mistake. This is why this, this spreadsheet is not protected in any way, and it's very easy for you to screw it up. But, um, you know, you can, you can hit up here the undo arrow a few times to see if it backs you back out of whatever you did wrong, or you're just going to have to bring up another spreadsheet to fix it. All right, so this is uh, now the target of if you wanted to try an elliptical facing at a longer facing length of 48. Um, tip opening a 105 and, and um, you know, uh, all, the other, all those other parameters I put in. So after you get your target curve, you want to come, come down and uh, drag, you know, let me show you how I did that again. You want to drag this formula. You, you come up and you highlight it, go to this lower right hand corner, click on that little black square and drag the formulas down that repopulates it with a copy of all, all those um, error, error functions. Because um, what I do is I, I often get close in my refacing work, and then I'll just recalculate the curve through the data um, to see how close I am to some other good curve and use that as the new target. And since I'm closer to that curve, it doesn't really matter There's uh, for most players. Um, you know, maybe I, as I get close, I might end up with a 49 or a 47 for a facing length or 103, 104 or a slightly different curve. Um, so that's the power of using a spreadsheet is you, you know, gradually uh, modify it during the middle of your work. A lot of times what I'll do, let me go back and just uh, data solve. Here I'm going to go and solve everything all over again like I had it. Never mind. Okay. So this should go back to the fit I had before. I usually highlight, take these three numbers, copy them over here, and that'll be like my starting parameters in case you want to go see what, the, what it is. And then for your target parameters, okay, um, okay, back to here. I've saved my starting parameters here just for, you know, in case I need them later. And I'll copy my target over here. Okay, and this, this is just so that if you lose these parameters or you decide to try something different, you don't like it, you can go grab these and plug them back in, okay? So it's just kind of like a squirrel 
hiding in that. Okay. Now sometimes when you go to solve uh, your spreadsheet, if, you're, if you start way off, it won't converge. So what you may have to do is go in here and manually change these numbers to kind of get them sort of close like this. And you can try, this is an in, instructive, so you can try changing some of these numbers to see how the curve changes. And you can manually get it pretty close, and you get an idea of what the solver does when it um, adjusts these numbers. So as you can tell, the start it actually has a uh, physical meaning. The start number is this up here. It is actually, if you had a zero thickness feeler, it is where the, uh, the curve first breaks away from the flat table, uh, where you would measure it at. So in this case, 45. You know, so it'll be a little past that first feeler. I just plugged in 50, so you can see the curve starts at 50. You know, the AB ratio is the aspect ratio. A is, uh, when this ratio is a one, A is the radius. So a lot of mouthpieces are in the five to six inch radius range. And this is calibrated in, in inches. So you can get a little feel for that, uh, what, what a radial curve looks like with this kind of a starting point. And you have to just adjust the starting point and the radius until it runs through your tip opening that you want. Or you have to use the solver to come up with a number that'll force it through the tip opening and the um, starting feeler. So, the other thing you may have to occasionally do is add, you know, what if you had a mouthpiece that had, let me plug in, let me plug in some more data, and a six, let's plug in a six here. Let's say you had something at four and you had more data that goes all the way up to uh, the last feeler, uh, eighth of an inch, 125. So right now in my spreadsheet, I don't have those last two. So what I have to do is I have to insert it. So I have to right click here, insert a row. Okay, now I have the, enough room for both. I go up to this cell, grab the lower right box, drag it down, and it'll copy the, this little formula here, which just says equal to A14. It's, it's finding the, the, copying down the cell from A14 into its location. I drag that down, and now this copies A15 down there. And then you have to do the same thing across here. For these two, row, this row here, you have to grab this lower right hand thing and copy it down. Okay, so now it copies down everything. My reference to these above two readings and then also uh, the ellipse formulas for those two numbers. So that's how you add cells. Now, and then you have to go to your scratch area and do the same thing. You have to add two rows here, insert, Insert two rows, and then copy these two down, and insert two rows here, and copy these two down. So that the plot will look like you want it to in this area. Now I forgot to, you know, in this dummy data, put in a bigger tip opening. So put 130 here. Now we got a 130 tip opening, let's say at 040. And this, this is now what the curve looks like. Okay. Now that's not going to, you know, this may play fine for some players, but it's got a resistance hump here when you try to find, uh, you know, when you do some curve fitting on it. So let me try to do a curve fit on that data solver. Um, minimum is still selected. I, mean, I have to select all three of these. Boom, boom, boom. Hit solve. Okay, so you can see it, it did the best it could. It fit an ellipse through the data, degree of 5.3, and sort of ignored 
well, these two points pulled the curve down, but the rest of the points pulled it more. So that, that hump you want to get rid of. You may want to get rid of that hump and then recalculate your um, curve to see, you know, what it looks like. So that's how you can improve a mouthpiece without going totally to a different curve to try to find the nearest curve to your data that is on the family of ellipses and it will play better than it currently does. So that's, I'm going to stop it right there for now. Um, other than sh just to go over here to this uh, report area, you notice when we inserted a row, it inserted a row right in the middle of my uh, report. So what I do is I highlight it all and then drag it up to fix that. So, you know, in another video I'll go over um, how I measure the baffle and also uh, I've got a little scratch area here on, uh, on uh, how I do some calculations to help me if I decide I need to tilt the table to open the tip. Um, I'll show you how I use that area. So, but that's enough for now. Now in the table of contents, I'll, uh, I'll put um, some time markers and um, where you can find different topics in here so you don't have to kind of search through the whole video to find certain topics you want to go over again.